You are listening to Next Up Nation, where leaders and influencers dish their secrets to inform, inspire, and entertain serious podcasters with host Tiffany Youngren. So speaking of podcasts, do you remember the very first one that you did? I do. I remember it really well because the first show we did was called Chat and Grow Masterminds. And I did it just because I love marketing. I wanted to get to know other business owners. And it was a labor of love. I had no real agenda. I knew it was good for marketing. We did a lot of content marketing, so it fit right in with that. And I'm one of those people, like, as much as I am in love with podcasting, I'm shocked that I don't remember the actual moment, my aha moment, but I can only assume it was a shower idea. <laughs> I grabbed my assistant at the time. She was my right-hand person for years, and she still does work for us, in fact. And uh, she and I did the first episode together, talked about, you know, our vision and things like that. And it was interview style, just like, just like we're doing with the Next Up Nation, interviewing the top people in the industry. So it was really fun. Do you, did you listen to that episode right away? I did. I did. You know, you learn so much from listening to, I hate it. I, like everyone, I, it's <laughs> like the worst thing, but you know, as an entrepreneur, you have to do things that you don't like. And I feel like there's, and I still do this. There's so many things I learn when I listen to an episode, quite frankly, I listened to it today. Cause you had mentioned like that you might ask me what even spurred it on. And so I listened back to it and looked at like all my forms and the checklist that kind of started this whole ball rolling with with what we're doing now and I love my intro for my first show I think it's my favorite well it's not it's my favorite until now like I love our intro for this show but I was like wow good intro girlfriend you know but the rest of it I it just I forced myself to listen to to learn from that's amazing how long ago was that that you started into podcasting well my first interview was on October 17th of 2017. So October 2017. And two months later, we launched our podcast. That's amazing. Now, when you got into it, you said you kind of did it a little bit on the whim. How long did it take before you actually saw how big the opportunity was and then learned how to monetize it? The following year, you know, what's so funny as I look the second podcast that we did. The second show we had was called Breakaway Agent. And we started that exactly a year later. So it's funny. And now we're launching Next Up Nation in August, which I'm like, wow, I'm two months ahead this year than <laughs> in the past. But but yeah, it was a year later. And that was really when we started focusing on monetization early on. You know, one of the things that's always amazed me about podcasting is being able to find and get to meet guests, but more importantly, how much deeper they go. What's been some of the surprising things you've seen about building some of those relationships and using it as a way to get into people who would generally be inaccessible otherwise? That's my favorite thing about podcasting, quite honestly. It really is the relationships, but the idea that I can ask someone to have a conversation with me about something they're excited about, and I admire them. And you can't really just pick up the phone and say, hi, I'm a stalker. I'd like to talk to you. Is that okay? <laughs> Whereas with podcasting, you're like, hi, can I ask you about how amazing you are and then promote you? Is that okay? And usually they'll, they'll say yes. I was able in our very first podcast show, I did interview Neil Patel. And it was just a matter of, and a lot of people are like, how did you get him? I mean, he is the king of SEO. And I just was like, I sent him an email and I said, I read your stuff. You're amazing. Uh, will you be on my podcast? And he forwarded an email to me and his assistant and said, told his assistant to set it up. So the idea that I got to pick his brain about SEO, something that is so important to marketing was, was a treat. And it continues like this season, the people that I've been able to meet with, it's incredible. And when you're looking for people who are experts in a specific area, so regardless of the industry, you're in your industry for a reason. And you can go and find these people that, can geek out with you or that you just admire and you want to know in a way that you couldn't do in any other platform. When you started from that to going to the next podcast, now launching this, has there been an evolution either in the platforms or the technology? Like, is it easier now, harder now? What do you, how do you feel about the whole thing? 
Well, we host through Libsyn and that's about the same. <laughs> like, I, don't, I don't think that's changed one bit. What's nice is it hasn't changed even in the sense of as additional p- podcasting directories and platforms come out, Libsyn still gets us covered. Like we're still out and everywhere. So they're keeping the technology up. But as you know, no, <laughs> the interface is about the same. However, yeah. podcasting in general really has little to do with who you host your podcast with. So fortunately, that doesn't matter. But I would say that podcasting as a whole has gotten, it's gotten easier and it's gotten harder. It's gotten more difficult because people's expectations of audience building is different. People are like, well, I want to, you know, this is like social media, but on steroids. So how do I get out to everyone? And you still have to work it. You still have to work at it. And it's easier because a lot more people know about it. Gone are the days where I would contact somebody like a business owner, a potential client, just regular people that I really just want to get to know and talk to. I used to have to explain to them what a podcast is and why they would want to be on it. Or if I was talking to someone about starting a podcast, the biggest thing that they would have in their mind was like, why would someone want to be on my show? And now everybody understands it. It was like, they understand guesting. They understand having people on your show and what the advantages is to that person. Uh, There's a lot less education that's required. And I would say just in the last three months, and you probably have seen this too, is podcasting has grown exponentially. So from last year to the beginning of this year, there was a big buzz about podcasting and how it's growing. And I've seen different numbers, but somewhere between 550,000 to 750,000 podcasts to now, it's like almost a million and a half. Mm -hmm. And, And a lot of that, I mean, they were still in six digits when we entered the beginning of the year. So in a year where there's so much, so many other things going on, and then to have so many people jumping into podcasting. It's exciting because the technology is available to us. They're having to race each other to get market share. So what that means for podcasters is that we have so many more tools and better tools at our disposal. So it's really exciting. It's an exciting time for sure. I remember when I started there were maybe like two or three blog posts on how to start a podcast. (laughs) I think it was like John Lee Dumas and maybe (laughs) one or two others. And now there's articles everywhere, kits you can buy. Like the irony is Libsyn's still the exact same. Yeah. But there just seems to be a lot more accessibility in terms of the equipment, the tools, the platforms. I know we're going to dive into it and I cannot wait for you to share the podcast ignition system. But before we do, I want to know at what point did you start to understand or see the glimmer of hope on how to monetize? And the reason I ask, the one challenge I always had had with podcasting is because it's an auditory medium, how do you get people to take action? Well, I have three main ways that I teach people to monetize their podcasts. The two, the first two ways are really the quickest. When we started Breakaway Agent, it was specifically to monetize. I quite honestly didn't care if I had an audience, (laughs) except that I knew my guests wanted me to have an audience. So I did put a lot of effort into it. We put a lot into social media and, and growing it. But my primary goal was to get in front of my ideal potential clients. And that's exactly what I did. And podcasting is just magical. And I could literally spend three hours talking about how, but there is a system that you will predictably get appointments with your dream clients using podcasting. And that's what I did. So when I had someone on, I was able to pre-qualify them. Do I want to work with them? I know that they've got the stats. I know that they've got the right amount of production and go get, you know, they're out and they understand marketing, but do I want to work with them? So podcasting, it was a two-way street. And I only invited people to meet with me afterwards if it was somebody that I felt like I would want to work with. But nearly every single one, I was, I could get an appointment with just about anybody using podcasting. So that was, that's number one is we call it uh, strategic guesting. So getting number one, getting your own ideal clients on the show. Number two is uh, we like, I, if you look at a, a pie shape, like if you look at a pie graph and three quarters of it is your ideal clients, that's, that's your, 
your guest strategy. And then a quarter of it is made up of two things. The bulk of that quarter is made up of people that you want to align with. So people in your industry who share or in complementary industries that share your target audience, that maybe they provide services that you don't, but you're both complementary to each other, but you can form an alliance together. Those make amazing guests as well. So that's just almost that other quarter. The remaining sliver are the rock stars and we all have them. We all have those people that were like, this is who I really want on my show. In fact, this is my call to action for today. If anybody knows how to get uh, Jay Abraham, I wish I had that whole list in front of me. I should have had it, but, but I have my dream list. So be sure to give me a shout out and I'll share that with everybody. But, and, oh, and Barbara Corcoran, if Barbara Corcoran, Jay Abraham and Ryan Serhant, those are my top three. So we so can just, help you with one of the three. Awesome. I'm so excited. So just think about it. Like these people that, and you get to lift them up. So our strategic guesting is a big part of it. And you can see like immediately, as soon as you start having interviews, you're building this sales pipeline. So you don't even have to release an episode like right now. I mean, we're recording our first launch group and I'm already meeting with people because of it. So that's really the I know we don't like the term low hanging fruit, but it really is the quickest win route to go. The other thing, and I think this is probably more along the lines of what you were just talking about is getting people to take action when they're listening to your show. So it's the on-air call to action. And it's really similar. We take a really similar approach to if you're at an event. So if you're speaking at an event you want an easy call to action that you can say words and people can easily do it. So a lot of times what we'll do is we'll have a really easy to remember a web address, you know, like download our kit or you know, think of one that just goes to the landing page. So people can just do it right then and just type it in because we forget quickly. And if it's some complicated thing, it's hard to do. Or if it's as simple as, you know, going to your website and say, click on this, but just something really simple that provides value. And remember that it's the top of the funnel, meaning that this is the the, your, their first, you know, you have a level of trust already. So they're a little bit further down the funnel, but you want it easy like that. You want it an easy yes so that they can just jump in and do it and have it specific to your podcast too, so that you're treating them differently than you would from someone who's just off the street, because these are your fans already. If they've taken action, they need to be valued like someone who did extra <laughs> above and beyond the guy on the street. And then the third way, you know, I don't even really talk about advertising because, you know, you have to have six figure downloads before you can really do much of that. Although again, with the cha quickly changing landscape of podcasting, that is changing as well. But the easiest, like the er earliest on without hundreds of thousands of listeners, having a sponsor that fits in with your show. So either something that makes sense, that they have a call to action, that for the listener, it doesn't disrupt them. I don't have a, a podcasting show. And then suddenly someone talks about landscaping or something. I, although restaurants I think could fit in because I talk about food so much, but, but you know, it just should fit in with the vibe of your show. And even if you had a feature where you have someone, maybe you've met them on your show through a, you know, through your strategic guesting and you're like, wow, we should align. And then that person's like, I really want a podcast, but I don't want to run my own podcast. Well, maybe they can share something out of their area of expertise and pay you some for the production. And then there you go. So there's a lot of ways to sponsor from day one, or I would suggest not doing that until month, you know, three or four, but potentially you could do that just right away. But I, you know, even so earlier on. So what are your thoughts when it comes to monetization? One of the things, like I honestly started my podcast by accident. Like I was like, I should do this thing. And I asked someone if they want to be on my show, assuming they'd say no, they said yes. And they're like, well, I'm going on vacation. So I can only do it like a week later. I'm like, I guess I'm a podcast. But I never thought about it from a monetization standpoint. So if somebody's coming to you thinking like, I want to create a show and I want to monetize it, what are the best avenues to go versus like, but you said it takes a while to get to sponsorship versus doing something that's closer to like your business. How do they balance that decision? Well, number one always has to be the quality of the show. So everything should go through that filter. You know, you have to really 
hold true to what you're promising the audience. Once it makes it past that filter, I think, I mean, I guess I just, I have more questions than answers. Like even when you went through it, I mean, you wanted to monetize early on. Isn't that right? I didn't know what I wanted to do. Yeah, you have, it happened by accident, but. <laughs> yeah, and I, I guess I'll come from it from two angles. One, I think like there's a huge opportunity for businesses to use it as to get past the gatekeeper. But I get cautious of people trying to create a podcast thinking, well, I'll take off and I'll get advertising dollars. Like that's hard. So how would you prioritize those three that you mentioned for somebody just starting out or even somebody that's, you know, 20, 30 episodes in? What's mm -hmm. like, how should they prioritize or manage those expectations? Well, and everyone's different, right? So for example, like you have a following, there are authors who are like, I would like to start a podcast or news anchors who are like, I'd like to start a podcast. Well, they have a following, so they might take a different approach, but the bulk of people who start podcasts that I talk to, I would say there's enough in setting up a podcast, just focus on strategic guesting just do that. And your call to action. Those two things have to be part of your setup. They have to be part when you're mapping it out. It has to just be part of it. Your call to action. You know, you imagine this podcast and you're putting this information out to people that want to hear what the topic is. And you don't just want to leave them and be like, okay, you're welcome. See ya. Good luck with that. You know, you want them to have kind of a next step or something that if they just got inspired, like what should, what can they do now? And so the call to action part of it really should feed that. But that also takes time. I feel like of the two things, the thing that they're going to make the money on the earliest is strategic guesting. And when it comes to building out a show, I made hundreds of mistakes, like forgetting to turn off the AC or the <laughs> heater what are some of the more common ones that you learned by accident? And is there any that were just colossal failures during an episode? There was one literally devastating, ended up on the floor with my hands over my face, just completely freaked out. And that never happens because I'm, I make mistakes all the time and I'm pretty, I mean, I'm a mom, you know, my kids have made sure that I know what mistakes I make in the past, not anymore so much, but you know, like I'm, I'm pretty transparent. I, I make mistakes fairly often <laughs> in this business. You know, I honestly, I love the mistakes because I feel like I wouldn't even have a system like I do if I didn't cherish those mistakes. The colossal one was actually the Neil Patel interview. I was so excited. Like I literally just started a podcast and it wasn't that cool yet. Like I was still having to tell people what it was. And so I'm like, oh my gosh, I get to interview Neil Patel and I'm in Billings, Montana. Everybody's like, I don't even know who that is. Like, who cares? I don't, that's, I'm not impressed. And I'm just like, I need someone to talk to. This is so exciting. So everybody who worked with me, they all knew. They all had to like read his stuff and know where I, what was happening. So it was this huge buildup. I actually tried to act, go out and do it in person, uh, but we weren't able to connect. We almost did, did it in person, but we weren't able to make that connection. So finally, my son came in, he was doing the audio and we were in an office in downtown Billings that we rented the back section to a magazine editor that I, we're really good friends. And so he came and we were talking about something and I was all ready for the interview. I'm like, this is the interview I've been waiting for. And he comes in and he starts talking about something and I stopped the recording so that it wasn't recording everything he was saying. <laughs> and you can see what's happening. Like I forgot to push record again. And so did the whole interview, found out that it hadn't recorded and yeah, quick, lots of calls to Zoom. Like, is there any way that we can recover this? My son saved it. So when you listen to the episode, there's like a different intro. Like the, it, it's definitely different than the other ones, not just because it was a cool interview, but my son salvaged it because you could hear the audio from the speaker. And so he was able to do the level. So it just shows how magic he was. He was like, could you not tell people that I did this episode? And I was like, I'm going to tell everyone you did it, but I'll make sure that they know, like you saved my hide, you know? But yeah, that was, that was epic. But my checklist at the beginning has definitely evolved over the years. I used to, I used to have Alexa turned on. I mentioned this earlier and my son's name was Alex and everyone's why I talk about him doing our sound. And every time she's like, I do not understand what you mean by that. And 
it's like, well, you're not invited to the party, so stop talking. <laughs> you know? that's, that's really funny. I don't know a podcaster who has done multiple episodes and has not at least once forgot to hit record. Oh, 100%. Well, what's yours? Do you have an epic fail? I called uh, my, one of my guests the wrong name. That oh. happened. Probably my most epic failure was a post episode promotion. So we sequence like two go out the day of the podcast, three days later, five days later, and then seven inches trips. And I had spelled the person's name wrong and it was really close to profanity, <gasps> which was oh, so no. embarrassing. So I had to go through and like clean up probably like 30 social posts, <laughs> correct the name and the tag. It was super embarrassing. But yeah, that's... You like I have no doubt. It's like anything in show business. You're gonna have egg on your face at some point. Like, yeah, you're gonna bomb or make mistakes. I'll be. I'm really grateful. Fortunately, like I didn't have any massive interview failures. Like my biggest fear is like I wasn't gonna be able to figure out what the question was, or I'd stumble and and go from there. But. Yeah. I've done the mispronunciation too. That's why it's one of the first, and I don't care what the person's name is. Yeah. I, and I think I've done it twice because one time I thought, oh, I know how to say this name. I think it was like Imogene or something. And it was like, no, it's Imogene. It's like, oh, okay. I will never start another <laughs> podcast without asking. <laughs> so right, the next week, our intake form is how would you like your name pronounced? <laughs> That's where you need like a recording. You need like a recording button, like upload a recording of you saying your own name. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Now here's one thing I've noticed that's helped make it successful. I want to know your process because your intake process is amazing. How much time do you invest into researching your guests and preparing for a show? I spend a lot less time now. We have a really streamlined process where First of all, when we bring in a guest, we've already, you know, they've fit certain criteria and the parts that we're not sure about get screened during the intake form. So we have a questionnaire that they have to fill out. And I've never rejected a guest based on the intake form, but it, not to say it couldn't happen. <laughs> I would just say like as a podcaster or as a business owner, you generally know how to screen and then sometimes stuff goes sideways. So that intake form is just really helpful when it comes to that. So that does a lot of the work because it's all, it's automated. So, you know, we send out prospecting emails and sequences based on people being interesting to us or fitting a certain criteria. And then the intake form goes out and then they fill that out. And from there, we have a day of interview script that's created automatically from that form, and it has all their information in it. And then I'm emailed a process that has all of their links and their submission information. So I can literally sit down and I can just pop open those, those websites really quickly on that same page, get to know who they are. And then it's got fields for me to just type in some thoughts or some questions so that I can really tailor that episode for them. So I would say in the old days, I probably, I mean, honestly, I spent anywhere from 20 to maybe 45 minutes, depending on the person and how hard it was to find their information. And now I am embarrassed to say it, but probably about like anywhere between three and seven minutes. (laughs) That's what a system can do for you. And so speaking of systems, like this is coming from a guy who would spend two or three hours prepping for interviews Now, granted, some of the guests, like I didn't want to embarrass myself because of really big names, but tell me more about the podcast ignition system. And I will tell you, for for people who are new to podcasting, just to preface this, the amount of work required to produce and distribute a podcast is immense. Like finding guests actually doing the show and then the post-production along with the distribution of sharing, like it literally was taking me anywhere from 30 to 40 hours per week. Like it was like a full-time job. Mm -hmm. That's why I took a year off when I was writing my book because there was just not enough time in the day to be a decent parent and do all that stuff. So when Tiffany told me about this system, I'm like, where have you been (laughs) for the last five years of my life? So (laughs) please like let the people know what this system is. Awesome. I would love to. Well, it really came out of 
the idea that, first of all, I just have to confess, every time I make, I click or spend a minute on anything, I feel like it's repetitive and should be automated. I'm the first person to automate it. Between that and embracing mistakes, I've developed some really good automations and scripts and processes, email scripts for prospecting, the strategies that have made us money. And, you know, I've run a a marketing agency since 2016. I've been in marketing since the 90s. And I didn't want it done for you. I want it done with you. I wanted something that would make it easy enough and, well, easy enough to where VAs could do it. Cause that's how we, you know, I have assistants who do a lot of these things. And then the things that I have to do, I want it more reliable. Not that, you know, I mean, my assistants are awesome, but I just, if I can automatically be sent things, then that's what I want. And once I put it together, I just thought, how can I box this up and make it so that other podcasters <laughs> could enjoy this and where I'm able to focus on the host and, you know, how can you save time? How can you save money? Like you mentioned, it takes a lot of time to put together a podcast. Now we're talking about serious podcasters, right? The ones who want to make money because of course you can just grab your phone and do a podcast. I'm of the optimization world. Like I, if I'm going to put any of my time, effort, money, blood, sweat, tears, and passion into it, it needs to matter. It needs to, like, I want to get as much out of that as I possibly can. And so that's, that's really what this process is about. I would say that with breakaway agent, we probably did about a third of what's included on the podcast ignition system. So to break down exactly what it does, you know, we, when you have a podcast, there are really three phases. There's pre-podcast. So it's the prep and the planning and all that. And that's ongoing because you're getting guests. Like you said, you're getting guests, you're prepping, um, you're, you know, measuring, (laughs) am I getting sales out of this? Is it worth it? And then the second part is the production. So it's breaking that one file, that one recording into multiple pieces of content. And you, that, and this is really where now we've tripled what we're able to do because that really takes a lot of effort. You know, if you think about it, you take, you take this recording and you're making blog posts and social media posts and a video for LinkedIn. I mean, a video for LinkedIn is a lot different than a video for YouTube. You know, you can't just plop the same one out to both places, but our podcast, it's really important that the actual podcast itself is as lightly edited as as possible. So if you really want to hear how the whole conversation went, always go to our podcast. If you want it more edited, go to our YouTube. And that's how our, that's how everyone's trained to do it. That's how our process is built. So we've streamlined the order of things and the tools that we use and the automations behind them so that it takes the fewest touches. Even when an assistant does it, we want it to take that person less time. And we don't, we want someone to be able to do it who maybe isn't a $60 an hour video editor, (laughs) you know, it it just needs to be something our team can just do. We can take things away and add them and, and it's all scalable. So that's the second part. And then the third part is the promotion. So it's taking of the pieces, combining it with the, you know, the writing and the images and and getting it out to the right place. Again, uh, what seems complicated, making it, when I say streamline, I just want it as simple to where it doesn't, it's light. It feels light. So there's a lot that goes into the startup of the system is one thing that I'm learning. You know, I've been doing it for years. So I'm like, oh yeah, you just like do this and you do that. And so we're actually rolling out a, a power start. So it's 21 days to a power rollout. And then we have like a celebration for the ignition to start. Right. And that's perfect for whether you already have a podcast, because a lot of podcasters converting into a system like this, they need to kind of get back to the basics and get everything in the right place, but not get so disrupted that they can't continue to do what they've been doing. So it really accommodates both while still getting everyone on the process. Because another piece of it is because there's usually a host and then their team that does a lot of it so that it's not taking their time. Both, you know, everybody needs to be on the same page. So uh, we provide a lot of support to the assistants. And because of that, it's really important that our hosts aren't picking and choosing to skip parts of the setup. So this is a good way to get everybody on board so we can do the most help and keep it light. 
as a coach, I can tell you, I would skip as many steps as possible <laughs> strictly because like, it just gets exhausting. I mean, yeah. by the time I was done editing and putting the blog post together, I was like, I'm done. Yeah. I'm so tired. And now like back then I didn't have to make an Instagram post, an Instagram story post, a Facebook story post. It was literally Facebook, Twitter. <laughs> now the old, there's the just days. so many variants. <laughs> yeah. There wasn't even video really back then. Like this is yeah. pre LinkedIn video. Oh man. Yeah. So, well, and LinkedIn was just a business card. Like nobody actually yeah. went on LinkedIn and did anything. So we'd really ignored LinkedIn and Twitter. I mean, Twitter was for foodies, you know, <laughs> it wasn't really a political place at the time. <laughs> so, yeah. And yeah. honestly now I think, and I don't know what you see, but I feel like now more than ever, people are leaving platforms and coming back to platforms. And so you just have to be everywhere because you don't know where those, per those people are going to be. In the old days, it seemed like marketers were, you know, shied away from, you know, pushing the content everywhere. But when you're creating the content specifically for that platform, you're, you know, you're, it's just like an ad where you see it everywhere. I mean, that's what you want. You want to just saturate that person's psyche like oh there it is again i need to go listen to it and if you're you know and you're putting out good content with the podcast i mean it's built for the audience so yeah it lends well to social media yeah. but there's a lot of places to go with it if i were to do it all over again i would have put it in more channels more often mm. that was like the one thing looking back that i wish i had done more of like i was surprised how much came out of pinterest oh yeah you know like we just traffic added pinterest cheap traffic yeah. And they're right. awesome because you can click on the picture and go to the website. Exactly. <laughs> like, why didn't we start with Pinterest? Like, how did, how did Instagram even get their space, their foot in that space, you know? <laughs> yeah. Oh, Pinterest, I think Pinterest is a bit of a sleeper when it comes to a content engine. Awesome, Tiffany. I cannot wait for this whole thing to launch, like the podcast world. I told you the moment you brought this up to me, I said, the, wor the podcast world has needed this. I needed it. I cannot wait to see this thing take off. Oh, well, thanks, Doug. And thanks Thank for encouraging me. I mean, you and you and Dominic really played a big part in it. You know, we're part of the Apex group and just getting that. I mean, podcasting is my favorite thing. So the idea that this is what I get to focus on and helping other people achieve their dreams in doing it is just, it's a blast. So it's really been a good, good change. Good thing. So where can people find you and the system? Uh, go to podcastignitionsystem.com or nextstepnation.com too. So both places will have it. Next Step Nation, you'll also find our podcast, which you're on right now. And there's a link in the bio in Next Step Nation. So if you click on that, you'll easily find the podcast ignition system. And, and what is the call to action for this week's episode? <laughs> oh, my rock star interview guest. <laughs> no, no. What I would love is I'm just really excited to be rolling out Next Step Nation. If everybody could just go and give us a review. If you've got some feedback that you think would help us, just send it to us directly. I'd be happy. I just feed off that kind of thing and appreciate it. But just comment and just be there and let us know you're there because we appreciate appreciate you. Tiffany, thanks so much for having me as the inaugural guest. It means Yay. the world to me. Oh, I'm so excited. Well, I'm going to, I warned you I was going to do this. I'm going to flip the, the chairs back around. Do thank it. You, thank you so much for doing it. I just greatly appreciate it. There is one question that I ask. It is a tradition around here. What is your favorite restaurant and what do you order? Oh, tough question because unfortunately it just <laughs> closed. Oh, no. So, uh, you know what? I'm going to go back to, can I pick what my like legacy favorite was a restaurant called De Racina in on 46th Street between 8th and 9th on Restaurant Row. Tiny little Italian restaurant in a basement. And every time I went there, they would tell you, like, I'd go to order, and he's like, No, no, no. And you'd take the menu from me. He's like, My family decides tonight. And they would come deliver, like, the most amazing food. And the one night, I normally don't eat this much, but they gave me a chicken parm, or sorry, veal parm, which is the best I've ever had, fresh pasta. And then they had. A bone ribeye, but they like filleted 
on this angle so it like fanned out perfectly. I've never uh, had anything better than that. Oh, yeah. And what town is this in? Uh, it's in Manhattan. In Manhattan. Yeah. Okay. Yum. That sounds delicious. It makes me want to go eat steak now. <laughs> I know. It doesn't matter what time of day I record these interviews. I'm always, my stomach's always growling by the end for sure. <laughs> so. Yeah. And you know, for me, it's five o'clock. So no, I'm really <laughs> going to be hungry. Oh man. Well, Doug, thank you so much again. It was just such a pleasure. And, ho- and I hope to get you on one of our future episodes where we flip the tables back, back around because I you've got a lot to share. And I love the title of your new book. Do you want to share that real quick with us and just tell us where we can find you? Yep. You can find me at douglasjfoley.com. The book is being released September 15th. It'll be everywhere you can buy books. And the title is called Breakout Blueprint, How to Find Your Passion, Take Action, and Build a Lifestyle Business. Awesome. Awesome. Look forward to it. I'm excited to read it. So, well, thanks to everyone who's listening. Thank you to our talented team. And remember, the best really is yet to come.